Okay, and welcome everybody. Thank you, Jordan Page, for bringing us in with that classic song, Listen, which I think is all about Double Cross Radio. We're here today on a special podcast with Dr. Antonella Carpenter and Randy Simmons, and they're going to tell us about some some injustice that's going on, how a... um, the fascism that's kind of man- manifests itself in the several government bureaucracies that, that tend to try and rule our lives is being expressed in the medical industry and is, is being focused unjustly on one person. And we, wanna, we want people to be aware of this. We want people to know what's going on because uh, this cannot be let to stand. This is something that's just it's un bearable for me to even know that this exists in my country that I grew up that I had a love a dear love for at one point in time that has just vanished due to the actions of the government that runs this country I still love the people that live here I still I still enjoy all my neighbors my friends and good people but the people we've we've voted too much power to the government and the people who are sociopathic power mad people have all gravitated to position those positions inside the government and they're using that power to abuse us at their at their profit so having said all that dr carpenter welcome back to our uh double cross radio thank you happy to have you here i'm happy to be here okay thank you especially this time where everybody's treating me uh, as i had the plague (laughs) oh yeah no i this is um We'll get it. We'll get into all this stuff. I think we have because this is a podcast. We have unlimited time. We have no constraints. Yeah. We don't have to stop. We can just go until we run out of things to say. And uh, now one of the things that I'm going to say is, is I don't, <laughs> I don't care who threatens me. If you're if you're from the FDA and you want to call me up and threaten me, go ahead. I have nothing to take. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a I'm just a poor old country guy sitting in front of a computer in a in a condominium in a little tiny hick town in Southern Oregon. <laughs> well, actually, Medford's not that hick. I kind of like it here, but um, to people in in Washington D.C., I'm sure it seems that way. Yeah, well, Washington D.C. also is the top of the corruption possible in human race. The head of the snake. Yeah, it's just so. Um, and I'm also we're also joined by Randy Simmons, who is uh, hi. So, Randy, you're you're officially a uh, son-in-law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. That's okay. Well. That's how I, I got, in, that's how I got involved. I'd be, honored, with I'd be honored to be Dr. Carpenter's son-in-law. So, um, I tell you, I he, still see it as the most important job I've ever had. You know. Yeah, well, and uh, he's he's here to kind of help with some of the uh, the facts of the case. We don't we don't want Dr. Carpenter to say something that would hurt her chances in court. But some things still have to be said. So he's here to help with that. Okay. And yeah. right. Um, so. The, the whole point is to get this information out there so more and more people can hear it and hopefully somebody with a bigger m- megaphone than double cross radio is going to hear it and is going to ask her on their show and and they're going to expose this to even more people and get some gathering momentum i mean I she's been under one type of attack or another since 2009. yeah i want to start out here by um uh, having Dr. Carpenter kind of describe the uh, the degrees that she holds, the education she's received in all fields. Um, I know that she's been trained and, and received education in a lot of different areas. She's a very highly intelligent woman. Um, so I yeah, want you my, to tell my, us what these my, are. My uh, main claim, although I have uh, done a lot of things on my own, is I'm a physicist. I am a degree physicist. With several degrees, you know, I'll go to all the three steps that you get to the doctorate. In Europe, it's called a doctorate. It's not called a PhD, but still, actually, is a lot more elaborate. And mine originally was the theoretical physics, and then I moved on to experimental physics. But that is everything has been physics. But as one of my professors said, uh, he's American, so he says PhD, not doctorate. But he said. A PhD in physics is a license to learn. So you can learn everything else you want. And as much as I always dislike medicine, I got totally accidentally into medicine. And medicine is nothing uh, as far as complication compared to physics is really nothing. And beside medicine, as much as they say is a science, it isn't. 
physics is the utmost science, the supreme science, as I say, because you have to have knowledge of math, you have to demonstrate a theory with mathematical support to make it a, a theory that stands on its own and is valid. And then you do, finally, empirical confirmation to demonstrate that what you're saying is in fact happening, okay? But the empirical side is not the demonstration and is not the support, the science behind it. And that, by going to normal educational process in a standard uh, school, bachelor, master, PhD, you get that in physics. And then after that, it takes you about 20 years to actually become a physicist, okay? That's what it takes. Yeah, I have, then, yes? I have great appreciation for that. I was uh, a chemistry major and I, um, I did, I did pretty well. I, I probably, I probably could have tried, uh, maybe a master's degree, but I, I was looking down the road and I was thinking, man, this is really, really hard. <laughs> right. Well, I and I, I appreciate the education I got so far, but, uh, you know, to that point, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, getting a doctorate in any of the physical sciences, that's either chemistry or physics and physics is a little tougher mathematically. Well, and right, and, and no so, so was, it's... Yeah, but as I said, I ended up in, uh, well, I ended up working for the defense industry because I was divorced and I had a daughter to support. So I had to do something, and as much as I did not like that, that was paid better than working in research at the university, so I did that. And I ended up working with weapons. And then from that, accidentally, totally accidentally happened to end up into the medical. And let me point it out that I did not want to get into it because I do not like medicine. And of course, I was married to a guy that kept pushing and pushing and pushing because he thought he could become a millionaire that way. It was just aggravating. But the turning point of my, from the point of refusing to work in medicine because I hated it and getting into it was because I saw what could be done. I found out, I had no idea. I found out what they were doing to those poor people unlucky enough to end up with cancer. I was just horrified. And when I realized that what I was doing could be the solution, then I decided, okay, I'll go along with it. But I wasn't fully convinced till I saw the results. And let me tell you the results, I knew it would work, I knew it was the way to go, but even the results surprised even me. They are just amazing what they can do, what it can so, do. To so they person. were, the results you res that you got that made you decide to go ahead were even better than you expected they would be, right? Yes, they were. And those are the ones, by the way, that I uh, gave the patent because I, I had applied uh, for a European patent, but they were stalling and they were uh, not sure and I had a lot of problem getting approved and then I sent in the, the first few results that I got when I was in Mexico and I got the pad. So now, the results for those of you so out there who are listening to the podcast want to know what the value of a European patent is, it's, it's equivalent to a, a patent in any industrialized country. It means that they've studied it and deemed that it's an effective treatment for this. Well, you have to realize one thing. Europe is a lot tougher for patent than the U.S. And they were they not... They a higher bar, huh? Yes, much higher. You have, you have a device. You cannot patent the device when it's only in drawing. You have to build it. And you have to prove that it does what you say it does. So I had to prove that I was getting those results. So just getting the European patent is a seal of approval that it works just because okay. of the way now, Europe works. Now this is an important point. If you guys are listening to this podcast, I want, you want to get a pen and a piece of paper and write down, European patent was approved. That is a you know, verification that this, this treatment works because they won't approve it if it doesn't. So that's a really, that's the first point that we want to make here. Okay. There's a link to the oh. patent right there on the front page of lasermedinc.com. There is, right. a link. there is a link to the patent. It's, a, it's kind of embedded in, in, in the words 
I was looking Let's, for it. Well, Randy, why don't you spell that out for everybody so they can and get your uh, pen and pencil pencil out already? So write this down. And right. Go and check this out after you listen it's, to this. Well, it's lazemedinc.com. That's L A S E M E D I N C dot com. Uh, the website has been up for a long time and it's been through a few changes, but and it's still up. But of course, Lays Med Inc is no longer in operation, so we have disclaimers on the front page now. You know, right? Uh, okay, but we're gonna. The way I, if you want to know how I started, it was originally created a company and trying to develop a weapon that uh, would have been a, a airplane or a truck mounted laser for combat situation and of course we never got any funding for that now uh, a major federal contract the defense contractor has uh, he's working on that one which was our idea in 1985 okay yeah, i think the chinese also have have they announced they have a weapon that can shoot down a drone so i think they're working mm-hmm. on it also right but see after all these years uh, uh, this started and you were doing this you were doing this how many years ago 1985 okay, almost so that is yeah that's almost 29 30. years ago okay. yeah almost and she has 30, a collection yes. of articles that we she calls the copycat articles because basically they're um, well four that's or five. Once, I, once i got into the medical right okay. but there's people that have done this as an innovative treatment and been recognized for it all over the world and her patent predates all of them even though they're doing a similar thing with yeah they were doing it with the nanoparticle i'm sure you heard some things about the nanoparticle and uh, the, the nanoparticle means nothing. It means that it's a molecule in the range of the nanometers. And uh, see, why, once I got into it, I found out that they had something called photodynamic therapy. And I said, well, you see, they're already doing it. There's no point of me doing it because they're already doing it in photodynamic therapy. And my ex-husband insisted, no, 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 blah, blah, you should go ahead with this. So I started doing more reading and I found out that it's close and it should have been, it was way far out of the field because the person that did the initial research on photodynamic therapy had no idea what he was doing or what science was, but anyway. So photodynamic therapy actually uses a drug and has been FDA approved. But keep in mind that FDA does not approve methodology all they approve is drugs so in this case the leash therapy is beyond the interest of fda because we never use drugs i removed the drug from the picture and i uh, explained that all it was is hyperthermia hyperthermia has always been known to kill viruses to kill sometimes cancer. And I say sometimes because the idea of hyperthermia is that cancer is more sensitive to heat than normal tissue, so you can kill the cancer but not kill the patient. And that can happen sometimes. But most of the time, the cancer is just sensitive to heat than any normal tissue. So the issue here was how do you kill the tumor with heat without hurting the healthy tissue? Because you cannot reach something like a 60 degree Celsius, which corresponds to 134 Fahrenheit. You cannot reach that temperature on the whole body and expect the person to survive. They're gonna die. But if somehow you can find a way to just have the tumor reach that temperature, then you know the tumor cannot escape death. It cannot survive because it gets cooked, okay? And heat kills tissue. So the point was how to make the cancer reach that temperature and nothing else. Well, the laser light that has started to come to life from semiconductor lasers have to have a wavelength not absorbing a significant amount by the health that the human tissue and it is a certain uh, semiconductor laser have a wavelength in a nanometer range that is not absorbed uh, in any significant amount to do damage by normal human tissue but because we're talking about absorption of light 
what could be done so the cancer only would absorb the light and not the surrounding tissue. And that's why it came to life, something that we call the oxygen, okay? And I tried to keep secret what that's it what was. That's what the FDA calls your drug. Yeah. Right. And the so-called oxygen is only water, salt to make a saline solution like a wound wash, and color. And the color... And then the color is just there to be a target, right? Yeah, the, the color is something that we... Uh, saline is to make sure that the tumor retains it. Because reta- the tumor retains anything that has even the minimal amount of, uh, of nourishment. And the color is so we'll absorb the light. And the color had to be something that is not damaging because there are several colors that can be really, uh, if not as bad as a drug, they can really be toxic. But food coloring, it isn't toxic because we can eat it. And it's not red dye number five. No. Yeah, it's because the FDA approved it. Well, even this one that I use, it's, it's just everything is FDA approved for human consumption, which means you can eat it, drink it, nothing is going to happen. Let yeah, alone so if you in, inject, yeah, and let alone if you inject it in a tumor. Yeah, but it's not genetically modified. <laughs> but the FDA paper says since it's used either in the diagnosis, treatment, or mitigation of uh, an ailment, it therefore becomes a drug. By Which that definition. doesn't, by the definition and of a drug, they just that's say. That's not true. You, you yeah. give people. Uh, um, basically saline solutions if they're dehydrated you get I mean right. and it becomes yeah. a drug when you do that I mean that's that's not yeah. a drug I know. come on yeah. they're, they're, they are trying to twist words and, they, and they'll use whatever jargon they can come up with to make this sound really impressive to a jury but this but is basic anybody that understands this some basic science realizes that this isn't a drug it's just something it's it's like seawater right mm-hmm. it's just nothing it's and a naturally color- occurring substance and the color is something that people can eat and is not damaged by heat because you use it in baking. So that's it. There is nothing for FDA to look into and there is nothing for FDA to approve. Nothing at all. And the laser, as far as the laser is used, it's low power, they're similar, not quite because it has to have a different uh, delivery system, but it's similar to the one used for healing and used by NASA in outer space because in outer space due to lack of oxygen and healing if somebody gets a cut healing is very slow so they use the laser light to aid healing so it is nothing and it's a low power so it's nothing damaged the fact that it works is it's a wavelength and not absorbing in any amount of importance by the human tissue is very low power is below FDA control but the color absorbs it, heats up the tumor, and the tumor dies. But the tumor does not die by being fried, like when you use uh, ionizing radiation. Because what do you think that uh, uh, radio uh, therapy does? It fries the tissue. So it's still heat, but just too much heat. This one doesn't do that. It just provides enough heat to cause an irreversible damage so the protein around the nucleus are coagulate, the cell cannot breathe and die. That is a scientific fact, but it dies in a different way than when it would die with chemo, which is poison or radiation, which fry the tissue. So obviously you have to use a different type of testing to verify that the tissue is dead. And let me tell you something, as much as I Hmm. tried over the years, they won't do to, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they won't do it. As much as I tried over the years to get labs to do it, to get uh, uh, doctors to do the testing uh, from university, no one would agree to do it. Why wouldn't they do the testing? If they are right in saying that this is nonsense and the tissue is not dead, well, then that testing will prove that it's not dead. But if I, uh, that I quote science, and correct, they will prove what I'm saying, and that's what they don't want, obviously. See, I, I, yeah, I'm listening to this kind of for the second time. We interviewed Dr. Carpenter a couple of years ago, and so I've I've heard some of this before, and this is I still find it fascinating the second time through that, and 
two years have gone by and still nobody is looking into those says well what about the fact that her patients survived and the tumors were gone and they were uh well that's a why isn't anybody problem. addressing this fact see that, that, what forced, they're holding against me is grand jury to the, take it. The, it's the nature of the human body okay the tumor is dead and it's called coagulation necrosis because it's dead right. caused by coagulation of the protein okay well that is a very slow process to decomposition and the nucleus stay on altar for a, it's dead but it doesn't decompose for a long time so the tumor is eliminated certainly by the immune system well. but very slowly Technically, the tumor is still there. It's just dead, and then it takes a long time for the body to, to push yeah. it out of the body. The, the whole thing. It does it a little bit at the time, and if the tumor is not very big, it, it happens faster. But we are still talking at least a year and a half. And people that do not understand what I say, they get easily scared. They get affected by your relatives. They say, oh, what did you do? Go see a real doctor. Then the real doctor says, oh, I can look at it and know that it's still a cancer. And then they convince patient to go through chemo. Yeah, and that's they say, why. oh, I don't like the look of that. Yeah. So is it, I mean, they, they really use psychological warfare on their patients to get them to, to you know, uh, to I adopt whatever it. therapy yeah. or treatment they want to push on them. Um, I've had reports of... Uh, patient being told oh I don't even have to do testing I look at it and I can see that it's cancer growing no yeah. you cannot do the proper testing and I have done uh, a video that is on the website that says put up or shut up all the people that were criticizing me you want to say that what I do doesn't work well do the proper testing and these are three choices either one of those three those are the proper testing and then if you're right, then you come out right. But if the science that I encode, which is science, is correct, then too bad, okay? And I cannot fight nature. The body takes a long time to heal, to remove the dead tissue. I cannot change that. But the patient feels great, doesn't have any problem, can work. Life is back to normal. Yes, occasionally the area gets sore and tender. That's because the blood is rushing there to remove uh, the dead tissue, and that is not a a constant condition it goes through different stages that happens when that happens the area is sore but other than that you do not have any other problem and the patient that had followed that when they had an attack they called me because they were scared and I reminded what I said to them the patient that follow my directive are today cancer free for years and they are fine they are healthy yeah now there's an interesting story. Uh, there was a couple, and I know you've told me this story before, but I I think we need to have it on this podcast. There was a couple that lived in an area where a lot of people that lived there were coming down with cancer because of contamination. Um, yeah. And go ahead and you tell that story because I will get something wrong if I tell it. Okay. So. Well, by the time she came to me, she, her husband already had uh, he had uh, tonsil cancer and uh, he was going through standard treatment. And while what was happening, she discovered a bump on her thyroid. She could feel it. For a long time before that, she had had problems, the swelling of the ankle, not being able to really uh, walk very well. Sometimes she used a cane and she had problem on her wrist that they call carpal tunnel syndrome. And then they call it uh, Oshimoto thyroiditis, all sorts of things, and nobody was coming up with the fact that it was thyroid cancer. So she did not know, but she knew she did not want to do what her husband did with his tonsillar cancer. So uh, she is not uh, born American, she's from Mexico originally. She's a citizen now, she was in the Air Force, so, but she uh, was born and raised in Mexico. and. Uh, so she looked at alternative and she came to see me and her was really small was about the size of a bottom the the the, the eraser at the bottom of a pencil that was about the size on her uh, thyroid and i told her i don't know but i will check and we checked it and it turned out to be cancer so i treated it and 
the day, you have to go to at least three sessions. Hers was so small, it wouldn't require any more than three. I thought about it, maybe she doesn't, but she said, no, 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 I want the three. And uh, the next day though, after the first treatment, she was already feeling better. And she knew something had happened. We did the three treatments, she went back home. Well, she no longer had carpal tunnel disease. She no longer needed a cane. And we're talking three days. Hmm. And uh, slowly her voice, because her voice had gotten really bad, and uh, she sounded like an old woman, and slowly her voice was going back to normal. But it was a slow process. Uh, she was really busy taking care of her husband because her husband, they decided that uh, from the tonsil, her husband, that uh, her uh, his cancer had spread to the lungs, so they had to, they put him in a uh, human trials for a new drug, all sorts of things. He was sick as a dog, he was in bad shape, she had to take care of him. So she really did not have time to pay attention to what she had, it was going on with her. Uh, her husband got worse and worse and her husband died. And she said that before he died, he told her, I wish I had listened to you and gone to see Dr. Carpenter. But by then it was way too late. So, and uh, he died. Then after he died, she started looking at herself. Well, by that time, her voice was back to normal. She went and they had some testing done and they couldn't find uh, the tumor. Uh, it was still a sack there, liquefied, and they thought it was a cyst. Hmm. But they still wanted to remove her, t uh, her thyroid, just in case. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> and she refused I it. think that doctors are a little bit too eager to cut people uh, up. I mean, everything, we, everything that's in our body is there for a reason. We need to keep it there as long as possible. And uh, surgery should always be the last resort. It shouldn't be the first thing you try. And thyroid, never. You can't remove, oh, we have these great drugs, we have Centroid, and, and that replaces the working of a thyroid. No, it doesn't. Okay, yeah. it doesn't. And it, a Centroid causes breast cancer anyway, so mm. there you have it. And it's, see, the thyroid, the, the beauty of all of our organs is they, they give you the proper dose of what you need when you need it. Right. And, and withhold it when you have too much and give you more when you need, when you have a deficiency or whatever. That's how they're supposed to work. When you're just taking medicine in a, in a pill or a bottle, you know, a liquid or a shot or something, you're getting a dose, whether you need that much or not. That's what you're getting. And so but also you don't know what else it can you never, do, and that's the problem. Yeah. They don't and know it, what else it, it can do. Yeah, and because it's synthetic, it's going to have problems with the way it was created. Manufacturing will have little trace little impurities or toxic substances that are in there but those um, are so the least of the problem the real problem is they do the testing and they only look at that one thing they don't know don't want to look at the whole system what does it do to the rest of the system and the example was uh, something that is a pet peeve of mine and is the drug Avastin that was originally used for breast cancer okay FDA approved it and did not recall, in spite of all the hundred of thousand complaints received by people that said the patient, my relative, died of inten intestinal bleeding. Avastin was meant to stop the, they thought the tumor is actually the body that does that, create new vessel to feed the tumor more. Well, if you stop the creation of your new vessel, you stop it in the entire body. And you mess up a person. It's not just the tumor you're affecting, you're affecting everything. And that's how people yeah. die. Okay? They, don't, they don't get, um, you know, like, I think I heard this from, well, I don't matter who it was, but he said that their, um, this, your liver completely replaces every cell in the liver every 30 days. Yeah. And wow. If they won't do that, if it doesn't have blood, it doesn't have new blood vessels hooking up to those new cells. Yeah, the person is so going to die. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy to think that's an effect. I mean, that's going to, that might kill the, can uh, kill the cancer, but it's going to kill the patient too. So, and uh, it never kills the whole cancer. It never kills yeah, the Yeah, that, that brings me to the next thing here that I want. And I, yeah. uh, full disclosure here, I asked her about this beforehand because I didn't want to state something and have it be wrong about this because I, I didn't want to, you know, overplay what his what she's accomplished but i want you to tell the listeners how many of your patients that underwent this treatment 
and followed all the uh, follow-up care that you uh, would recommend to them, how many of them uh, survived? I really don't have the numbers because some lost touch, and I know they are well, but I lost the touch. But okay, I can tell you as a general rule, I probably treated, I don't know, 300 or more, but I can tell you that definitely half of that is fine. So would it, be safe to, would it be safe to say that um, um, as far as you know, that all of the people that followed the protocols that you told them to follow uh, survived their, their cancer? Yes, they all did. They, they, it's not just that they survived, they lived well. They're living yeah. well. With it's no side effects. Wrong. No side effects. There is nothing wrong with them. They live a normal life, do the things they wanted to do. They have not been mutilated. They don't have, have not developed other problems, not having heart attacks or anything because, and they don't have reoccurrences unless like some patient decided to have hormonal replacement therapy and then, oh, uh, my breast cancer is back. Well, I don't know if it's back or not, it might be just uh, the healing process, but if you are on hormonal replacement therapy, all bets are off, okay? I can't do anything about that because hormonal replacement therapy causes breast cancer. So they could yeah. have other occurrences that have nothing to do with the treatment, but if they don't do anything, and I tell you about other patients that actually didn't listen to me, went off and had chemo, and then of course the doctor were uh, exasperated because the chemo wasn't doing anything to the tumor. Of course not. Already dead. The tumor is dead, it won't absorb anything. It's damaged everything else, but not the tumor. And some actually call me, what can I do because the tumor was out of the skin? They say, what can I do? Well, stop what you're doing and uh, spray some vinegar on it to help dry up and heal. Uh, that's all is needed. And let me tell you something, there are some healing pictures on the website. And Randy, tell you what they said to you about those. Oh, God. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, they've been on the website for a couple of years, right? But when these, oh, in 2009, this team of, uh, it was really three main trolls started following Dr. Carpenter everywhere anybody talked about her in web forums online and um, started putting up links to uh, this section of the Lays Med Inc. website. And it's just healing is the name of the page. Uh, if you go to laysmedinc.com and push the menu button that says healing, it'll take you there to the page with two different uh, sets of, of photos that were sent in by patients that... Uh, well, the, they all go through a phase of scabbing where there's this... If it's out of the skin. Right. But there's no other better way, I guess, to describe it. It looks like, it looks like scabbing, you know, uh, happening over the course of uh, months. And one of the trolls thought it was a funny comment, I guess, and, 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 uh, and people started uh, throwing it back and forth. You know, they, acu they accused it of first being Photoshopped and then... No, it's not Photoshop. You're putting Play-Doh. Uh, it looks like Play-Doh on that patient's chest. And that in itself was pretty ridiculous. But what really got ridiculous was when I was um, being questioned, one of the jurors actually said, well, what about the Play-Doh on the chest? And uh, that, at that moment, I knew that, oh, my God. Oh, my God. We have crossed over the line into... Uh. <laughs> Beyond slander. And, uh, for those, for the people listening, when he's referring to the jury, this was a grand jury. So, um, grand jury always interviews the right uh, all the people involved. They try and get information to decide whether they should bring an indictment or not, whether the crime has been committed. So, that when he talks about the juror asking him a question, that's what they do. So, continue but on. I was just going to say one of the. the um, uh, I walked out of there, you know, feeling yeah emotionally eviscerated pretty much but one good thing um the lawyers um they the uh, u.s attorneys they 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 kept trying to come back to this line of thinking that i created this website and uh i assisted with the her radio show and i did all of this uh despite knowing that her treatment didn't work 
you know they they kept coming back to that but you knew the treatment did no i didn't you know that's the whole point and i knew it worked i got it. yeah they kept they kept throwing it back in my face in that line of of uh talking three two or three times in a row finally the third time uh, I had already n known that I was going to do this. I went to change.org where Dr. Carpenter's got a couple of petitions up there. Anybody can go to change.org and just put in Dr. Carpenter in the search box and you'll find them. And you'll also find one created by the, uh, the troll. She got about 32 signatures, I think. But anyway, <laughs> um, I had printed up the comment sections out of these petitions and they were from you know just uh, supporting individuals that read about it and they were also from former patients of hers that came by and uh, I had like 17 pages of them this uh, this lady uh, cured my mother this woman saved my wife's life this woman saved my father's life and one after the other after the other uh, they they took it from me and put an evidence sticker on it and called people's exhibit B or something and you know I, I really I thought at that point well maybe maybe somebody will listen but no yeah yeah and so <laughs> this 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 story which you just um, retold here it just shows how the um, the government lawyers they're kind of the equivalent of you know in your county of having a district attorney but the government lawyers are being put up there to push the case that the fda wants them to push because the fda is being pushed by the pharmaceutical company that stands to lose billions of dollars yep. if this l less expensive and you know almost 100 percent effective we don't we can't say 100 percent because there might be somebody that doesn't work on someday but it was just it virtually 100% of her patients were cured. Um, you know, if this treatment is allowed to happen, well, then all this, all this part of our U.S. economy that's spent on killing people with chemotherapy is going to go by the wayside. And, and how are we going to be able to afford the, the payments on that French chateau we have and, you know, things like that. So they, they are very much financially tied into this technology, this treatment going away. Because some people say, oh, but, uh, the gross general uh, uh, product will be messed up. No, they won't. We'll spend money in invalid things in life. Yeah, and not only that, we'll keep, we'll keep highly productive people in the workforce <laughs> instead yes. of yeah. them off. Highly skilled and highly productive people, they stay in the workforce and they will uh, uh, warn the younger ones. That's what they don't want. You know the movie Logan Run? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, over 30 you have to be killed off because you know too much you know <laughs> that's exactly right um so i was gonna i just thought that um the turnabout is fair play and because the fda has set up this kangaroo court to to try and um get rid of dr carpenter i thought it's fair as fair we should have a kangaroo court on this podcast for the fda and i'm, I'm going to bring uh, charges against the FDA of um, violating their mission statement and violating the public trust and, cre and creating the crime of malfeasance in the uh, completion of their duties as assigned by uh, the government of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're having a trial on that and I'm going to be both the, the uh, prosecuting attorney and the witness because uh, I, they're not here, so I'm gonna. I, I what happened is, um, yeah, I kind of had this dream of what it would be like in a utopia where everything went the way it's supposed to go and the truth wins every time. How would how would a trial like this go? And I got to thinking about that movie Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. He says, "Well, so we have a witness that is just under some kind of a spell where he has to tell the truth. He he's compelled to tell the truth. He can't lie." And so this is how that trial might go. Hmm. And so I started off, I say, um, what is the mission of the FDA? And his answer is, the FDA's mission is to promote and protect the public health by helping safe and effective products reach the market in a timely way and monitoring products for continued safety after they are in use. Our work is a blending of law and science aimed at protecting consumers. 
So my next question, what measures were taken to ensure the public was protected from potential harm from aspartame? And his answer, our director, Arthur Hayes Hall Jr. appointed a five-person scientific commission to review the original decision not to approve aspartame in 1981. And what was their finding? They were going to uphold the ban by a three to two vote. When Mr. Hole appointed a sixth member, the resulting vote became three to three. Mr. Hole then broke the tie by voting to overturn the previous decision. What became of Mr. Hole? He left the FDA under allegations of impropriety and then took a position with Burston Marsteller, a public relations firm that had been retained by J.D. Searle and Monsanto. J.D. Searle was the company that developed aspartame and Monsanto purchased J.D. Searle soon after this was approved. How did Mr. Hurl, Mr. Hull, excuse me, become the head of the FDA? He was appointed by Ronald Reagan at the suggestion of his transition team headed by Donald Rumsfeld. Wasn't mm -hmm. Donald Rumsfeld CEO of J.D. Searle at that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Yes, I suppose so. Isn't it true that at temperatures above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, aspartame breaks down into two to toxic poisons, methyl alcohol and formaldehyde? Yes. Then the FDA approved the introduction of a toxic substance into the food supply of Americans. Yes, but only at temperatures above 85 degrees. What is the body temperature of the human body? 98.6 <laughs> degrees? Is that sufficient to have aspartame break down to these two poisons? Yes. Do you have any estimate as to how many people have died from the adverse as effects of aspartame in the food supply? No. Research has shown that it is a contributing factor in MS, ALS, memory loss, hormonal problems, epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, hypoglycemia, AIDS, dementia, brain lesions, neuroendocrine disorders. What is keeping the FDA from pulling this product from our food supply? I don't know. Not everybody gets sick from aspartame. Yes, that's true. Some people just put on tons of weight until their health fails from conditions related to obesity. Why did you raid Dr. Carpenter? Well, there was an issue of public safety. Wasn't there an issue of public safety with aspartame? Yes. So the decisions to act in public interest have nothing to do with real harm, and they're really just arbitrary decisions. Is that correct? Yes, we try to protect established manufacturers because they fund a lot of stuff for us. When we go after someone, we try and pick out someone who has limited resources so we won't be embarrassed by a trial. We make sure we avoid trial by stealing all the assets and confiscating all pertinent information. Okay, so that was my dream trial mm -hmm. that, that, that would maybe the American people could tune into someday. Nice. Um, I'm not holding my breath, but <laughs> I just wanted to, to put that in the middle of our show to let you people know that the FDA is a total criminal organization. For sure. Yes. And uh, so the, right now they're, they're attacking Dr. Carpenter, and you're saying, well, since they're not attacking me, why do I care about this? Well, you may be next. You never know. Or maybe you may come down with cancer and wish she was here with that treatment to save your life. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Dr. Carpenter back to the witness stand here. Okay. And um, she's already kind of described the treatment um, but of how her therapy works. I'd like her to describe um, kind of a, a, in general terms how chemotherapy works and, and how normal cancer treatment proceeds. I, I have a my former college roommate and he's the best man at my first wedding um probably the best friend i've ever had in the world uh, he's i think he's probably not going to make it he's suffering from cancer and um i uh, love this guy I, I love him better than my brothers he's just the best friend i've ever had um he trusts doctors too much yeah. and he had a uh oh, he had some uh, prostate troubles some cancer there and they removed the cancer, the tumor, which is the first thing they always do. Ah. And I'll let Dr. Carpenter finish the story from there because it's the same for all cancer patients. It is the same. They don't necessarily go for surgery as a first uh, attack because when they come in and say, your tumor is too big to operate on it now, so we'll give you chemo to shrink the tumor and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, operate on you and then we'll give you more chemo and radiation. That's pretty much. Either that or they operate first, then chemo and then radiation. Now keep in mind one thing. 
the surgery done on a live tumor involves of course bleeding like all surgery and that spreads the cancer in a lot of distant places because of the bleeding involved in surgery. The doctors from what I've heard know that but they still do it and then they say oh that's okay we'll give you chemo and we'll kill the floaters. Okay what is chemo? What is the theory behind the working of chemo? No matter what they're saying today that we have new drugs that they can selectively attack the cancer, that is an absolute lie. Chemo is pumping your body with poison. Poison gets into all the cells, but healthy cells eliminate the poison faster than cancer does because it's just like in the case of the stain I use. The cancer has a slow metabolism and hold whatever you put in longer than healthy tissue would do. Now, in the case of my treatment, there is no really valid nourishment in what I provide, where I inject and beside, I don't inject it outside the tumor, but inside the tumor, that's, the, that's what I did. Uh, then it stays in the tumor long enough for the treatment to be completed in an hour and a half. But the uh, poison stays in the cell for a while, not as long as it will remain in the cancer. So the hope is that it stays by lingering longer in the cancer, will kill the cancer and not the healthy cell. But that's absolute nonsense because poison is poison. And if it doesn't kill you right off, it certainly does ma major damage. Yeah, it might kill uh, some of the tumor, but it definitely messes up your end forever. Plus, there are people that cannot handle poison and die right off. Why? Yeah, like Patrick Swayze. Hmm. Well, actually, it took him. They call it success because he lasted a year and a half of torture. They call it a success. Same with uh, uh, Robert Kennedy. He lasted a year and a half because that's exactly what about it takes when you are on chemo. Not in the old days with cisplatin, they were dropping off like fly right off. And some still do. But now they are trying to make the patient last longer. They know they're going to die, but they try to let them live longer so they can make more money. Because if the patient dies right off, the drug companies don't make enough money. So if they slow down the process, then and the chemo is less toxic right off, then the patient can take several treatment and they make a bundle. Because the way today is, they use a cocktail of poison. They don't just use one poison. It's a cocktail of poison and each injection uh, will cost about thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars One injection, one infusion, because it's usually in the, in the bloodstream. But that's what it is. The chemo works based on the fact that we poison you to an inch of your life hoping that only the cancer will die and not you. Yeah, I, there's a there's a reason why 80% of all doctors, these were surveyed, there was, I think it was, uh, the survey wasn't all doctors, that they surveyed, I believe the number was two, 256 doctors. Yeah. And 80% of them said that if they had the choice, they would decline chemotherapy. They would see, rather take their chances with something else. Mm. Well, see, that's another thing, okay? They are trying to put you in a situation when you do not have any choice, either by smiling in your face and stabbing you in the back, uh, not actually, but effectively, and by lying to you, because I think that a lot of things that are taught in medical school is how to lie to a patient smiling, with a smile on your face. Well, and Dr. Hart, you remember now, a few years ago, there was this article that you used to talk about on your show. and. Uh, we actually watched the article change. Uh, it was there was a doctor in uh, it was in Little Rock. Little Rock. He, uh, he he committed suicide, and uh, he was an oncologist, was he not? Yes, and uh, he was treating children. And when he found out he himself had cancer, he killed himself. That was the story when it happened. And then, of course, everything yeah. changed. And they knew, you know, he was not an oncologist. 
no he was orthopedic he wasn't. surgeon or something yeah yeah it was not and he uh, it just didn't look think, good to have an oncologist committing suicide after finding out he had cancer yeah so they had to and change the perspective it. of having cancer treatment has the, and the other thing is that they are trying to make you believe that you do not have the freedom of choice you have to have chemotherapy you have to have radiation now wait a minute people are having a fit of Fukushima because of that radiation escaping causes cancer and now how come you're using radiation to treat the cancer that's a different kind of radiation <laughs> No, it's just the same. And uh, it's still gamma rays. Gamma rays are gamma rays. And, and uh, maybe one treatment will not have a massive amount, but it's cumulative. So uh, eventually. There's an interesting side note to this that we covered on one of our shows. Um, the, the USS Ronald Reagan's aircraft carrier was there um, to give aid at Fukushima. Yeah. And they were anchored offshore, and they started doing radiation testing just kind of routinely, and they realized, oh, my gosh, we're getting dosed way more than a safe level. So they put the engines in reverse and backed that thing out to 50 miles offshore, and yeah. but it was too late. And all the sailors that were serving on that ship are starting to drop like flies now. Damn. They're all getting cancer. Um, so, yeah, they're... Know- Radiation uh, therapy doesn't work so well either. Uh, If you can maybe localize it in an area where it's not uh, in your your core region, you might be a little luckier than someone else, but... uh, No, you can't because ionizing radiation cannot be stopped. You have to have 12 feet of lead. As far as I am concerned, I don't believe our chest has 12 uh, inches of lead inside. Yeah. So... We'd be too mobile if it did, Um, (laughs) but... Uh, the 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 documents that I've read about chemotherapy say that at at the best you maybe have a ten percent chance of being a cancer survivor, and they define that as living five years past the treatment. Which right. so if you live five years in one day and then drop dead, you're a cancer survivor. Exactly. Right. Um, right. Cancer survivor. And as few as one percent of the patients survive. So um, it kind of depends on what kind of cancer you have and how long you've had it. Um, yeah, but they lie. They lie to people too and say, oh, there is this rate of survival. If you listen to them, oh, this rate of survival and it's such an improvement over 60 years. Was this article that said uh, in the 60 years ago, the survival rate was 1%. Now it's as high as 4%. Yeah. Okay, that means that 96% are still dying. Okay. Yes, and it's... um and my friend who's going through this treatment, he he had his uh, tumor removed from his prostate. He underwent chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And that was about a year and a half ago. And then he was, he kind of was careful because he's has got real light skin. He's kind of con- always been concerned about skin cancer and he felt a lump on his leg. And he went in to have it checked and it was, cancer was back. A year and a half. No, that's about that's about the time you were saying about eighteen months. And yeah. they did a scan of his body, and they found that his body is full of cancer everywhere, and that's because of the, the chemotherapy destroyed Everybody. his immune system. His your body normally would be able to destroy a cancer cell as it's formed because it has that ability only to do that. The body can do it only if they're floater cell and not in large amount. Then the right. body can do it. But once they start coalescing into a tumor, the body cannot do it. Because right. the tumor but they can do it as a single cell. His, yeah. his immune system was destroyed, so all those single cells grew into, into tumors. And they were too many anyway. Too but many, also All over be, his body. And because and the chemo does that too. It does damage that creates a, a growth of cancer. Okay? Yep. And nobody wants to admit to it because they make too much money with the chemo. Radiation, they make money, but not as much as chemo because chemo goes on and on and on, okay? Till the person dies. And, and they're always uh, developing new chemos. Yeah. So, so anyway, all this, all this chemotherapy medicine has been approved by the FDA. 
and it's killing it. people by the millions. And uh, when and FDA gets uh, gets information that this uh, this chemotherapeutical agent is creating problem, the comment from FDA and from all the doctors is the advantages overweigh the risks. I don't think so. Well, and I, I think that if that was really how they thought, if that was really the, how they rationalized things out, why did they postpone approval of a drug that could save people's lives for as many as 20 years while 50,000 people per year are dying of this disease. Uh, and they'll postpone that and make them go through all these different tests. These people are going to die anyway. Why couldn't they just let them use the drug? I mean, that's the same rationale they use about the chemotherapy. It doesn't make any sense. They are not consistent. They're just... The reason they do this by uh, making people jump through all these hoops is they're trying to limit entry into the marketplace so the pharmaceutical companies don't have any competition. Yeah, they violate the antitrust law and I always felt that that's what was my case. Violation of the antitrust law because I have something that will eliminate the need for all of those outrageous expenses and all those drugs. And by the way, this is something that some of my patients have said. The comment is that FDA knows that what I do works. In yeah. fact, when I had, when I was raided, and I was talking in another room with Jeremy Bain, one day we're still in the other room, we're stealing everything I own in my office, and they call it confiscation, but it's stealing. And uh, uh, if they I take something that doesn't belong to them, uh, it's stealing. Yeah, it is, but the claim was that that was for the public safety. Um, I told Jeremy Bain that the very people that are tormenting me are the ones that know that what I do, it works. And there was a smirk on his face. He didn't say anything, but the smirk on his face told me everything. He knew that. Yeah. Now, um, I think we're coming up on about an hour here, and I, I, I think if we make this too long, no one will want to listen to it. Okay. So, and I think we've covered this really well. Uh, this is even better than the time we had you on the show two years ago. Yeah, um, I don't remember at all. I, I have no proof of what I'm going to say next. This is just me trying to figure out why, well, what motivates these people to go and stop this practice that was actually saving people's lives, improving their condition, uh, giving them a chance to live a longer and, pr and pr more productive life. You know, what would motivate them to go and shut that down? Well, I remember back to this, to this mock trial I did with uh, how the GD Searle company used the political muscle of Donald Rumsfeld to approve aspartame. They got their people in the, in the key positions that they needed to be in, and then they just rammed it through. And anybody that spoke out against them, they got demoted, fired, asked to resign. They set them up. They do. They get rid of them. Yeah. So people keep their head down. They don't speak out. They're not. They're afraid. Well, I got to tell you, all you people that are afraid. I, I hope that you guys don't come down with cancer and need this and need this procedure. Because it's not there. Because you were afraid to speak out. Yeah. And, you know, you might be digging your own grave here. This yeah, is really, really something right. that's that's really happening in our country that everybody's afraid of the government now that's a bad situation well the government made sure that people will become afraid of it okay yes that and was if an we don't stand up and stop this if we don't just stand up and say no more this injustice cannot stand if we are to remain free well i think larkin rose said it pretty well i saw a video he did about a week ago he said this country has fallen in love with authority yeah. I don't have to well, have them. Authority figures. That's true. And in the medical industry, And I think it's the, it's the that same programming thing. starts in, in public schools. And, you know, earliest years, one of the things yeah. I remember really does. From, my, from my early years in grade school is that the teacher was the last word. And if they, what they said when. If you didn't want to do what they did, that you got punished. And you had to behave. You had to obey the rules. And the teacher made the rules. And when somebody was doing something somebody else didn't want, they'd say, teacher, can't you make a rule? 
right. and then the teacher would do something. So we get that positive reinforcement that we want another rule. We want more limitations on our freedom. Well, this is what happens when you give a government a lot of power. And when you're talking about your health, that is not a good thing to do. It is not it's, a good thing. It's not they a good thing. Poison in anything. your food because they yeah. can make money. And what can you? The people that stand up and say something about it, well, they get blackballed. Now, you were a whistleblower yeah. once in the la yeah. laser industry. You yeah, got blackballed. You know how that goes too, right? Oh yeah, you cannot tell this equipment is faulty. They didn't do the proper testing and it will malfunction and blow up in the silo. And I was thrown out as a traitor. Yeah, yeah. I was thrown out of the defense industry as a traitor. So, so I want to go ahead. Here, here's what here's what you can do if you're as outraged as I am. First of all, Randy told you about the uh, change.org petition. You should go there and you should get involved with that. Definitely. It doesn't hurt at all, though. I think that most congressmen are bought and paid for by the same people that have bought and paid yeah. for the FDA. But it doesn't hurt to call them and let them know that you're pretty upset that this is going on. Well, and no, if they, they get if they get thousands of calls like that, they're going to start saying, "Well, what what is going on here?" And there might be a little light shed on this whole thing. What all I was going to say was another thing about that petition is uh, we never officially were able to get. Um, Whenever you set up a petition on change.org, you have to have what they call an email target for your petition. In other words, that's an address that uh, progress reports on your petition will be sent to, you know, every so often. This many signatures came in. Uh, and we never were able to establish one because every time we would send in a different uh, uh, .gov email address, it would get blocked. Uh, people at the FDA kept blocking our email address at change.org. So, yeah. The, the only the only result of that petition at all was me sitting in the grand jury with that stack of paper <laughs> because that was you know they they couldn't refuse my right to say that yeah they could ignore it though and that's what they did yeah 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 so i'd also like everybody to remember the this uh this man's been quoted a lot especially in the last 15 years because <laughs> it's it's getting worse by the day. But it was Martin Niemöller, who was oh, yeah. one of the victims of the Nazis in World War II. He was a priest, wasn't he? He was a, he was a Presbyterian minister, yes. Hmm. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Amen. And that's how it's going to be if you guys out there don't stand up and say, this is enough, and draw your line in the sand and say, no more. I refuse to consent to this illegal, immoral government. We demand our constitutional rights that are own, they're not given to us by the government, they're protected by the government. We demand that you fulfill your stated mission and stop persecuting innocent people for actually doing something that benefits humanity for a change. Yeah. And I, I just, this whole incident just really upsets me. It upsets that there are fewer people that are willing to stand up and say something about this than there are. And it, it just really gets me that people just don't have the courage. You people that are just silent on this issue, you're slaves already. And you don't know it. Yeah. It upsets me too. We've been, we've tried and tried and tried for years to get her story out there, and it's just there's a, a ceiling of some kind. You know, you can't get beyond that little bubble of uh, yeah. Exposure. Harriet Tubman, she was a conductor on the Underground Railway, right? Oh, and she's a, got another famous quote that I this quote changed my life. And she said, "I freed a thousand slaves on the Underground Railway." I could have saved. I could have saved a thousand more, but they didn't know they were slaves. Mm. People, you got to wake up. You don't have much time left. If we yeah. don't stop them, it's all over. It's end game. Yeah, and it is. And My life has been totally ruined. This, this is a mountain worth fighting for, right here. This, this isn't a little molehill. This isn't something that isn't con consequential in your life. This is something that is worth standing up for. The FDA is a criminal organization. They are 
controlled, totally controlled by the food companies like Monsanto and the pharmaceutical companies um, that are putting out poisonous drugs and vaccines that have mercury in them, thimerosal. Um, Unbelievable. It's, it's, this is something that ha- this organization has to be terminated. Yeah. They aren't doing anybody any good. They aren't fulfilling their mission. So no. I feel better having said that, but I don't feel better knowing that, that this, having said that isn't enough to set Dr. Carpenter free and, and to free her of all these charges and to let her go on and live the rest of her life. This is somebody, an amazing individual. She's incredibly intelligent. She, was, she said that she discovered this kind of by accident, but no, it, it might have been an accident that, it, that she saw it and witnessed it, but she was smart enough to understand what it was. Other people have probably witnessed something similar and didn't didn't think it was noteworthy. This is something that could save literally millions of people's lives. And if it's being follow, withheld from us because they don't want to lose money they're making on chemotherapy. And that's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Now we she can't worry. say that because she'll they'll they'll probably add more charges to her case. <laughs> this is me, Chuck Horton, saying that. You come after me, FDA. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what uh, all I know is what you're doing is wrong, and I'd be a, I'd be ashamed to work for an organization like this. Anybody out there that works for the FDA, and you're just sitting there hunkering down because you gotta make your house payment, start looking for another job. Do something that's honorable. Stop working for a criminal organization. I know, and, and but the doctors out there, you guys gotta start making a stand too, because you know you guys are gonna get cancer too. Yeah. Everybody does because of the drugs that are out there. Most of oh. the cancer cases, all of this outrageous number of cancer patients everywhere, that is because of drugs. Didn't used to exist 50, 60 years ago. No. Yeah. Uh, and there's still places in this world where cancer is almost unknown, but one of the traits that these places share is they don't have doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Well, yeah. one of patients of mine said his parents were healthy. They had no problem whatsoever. Why? Because they never went to see doctor and there never been no medication. That's sure. there's a lot of truth in that. Oh yeah. So. Well, you know, it's been a joy having you on the program, Randy. Uh, is there anything more you want to say on behalf of? Uh, Dr. Carpenter that she really shouldn't say? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm uh, for one thing, I'm uh, thank you, Chuck. I'm glad. Uh, I, I really appreciate you going out of your way to do this uh, kind of off the grid, so to speak. You know, I, I, I'm, I just, I, I want other people to hear the story because you're not going to hear it on uh, the big alternative media. You know, uh, you're really not. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I think what they've done is is something horrible. Not just because I worked for them and I lost my job with them, but because I saw every week I uploaded new stories to the website, new testimonials that came in, and people accused us of making them up. No, they weren't made up. They all came in the same way. They all got added to the website the same way. Uh, I just uh, I just think it's wrong, and I think people need to need to take a uh, people are waking up to a lot of things but this is this is a part of the story that uh, that for some reason just is not getting a whole lot of exposure except for the mainstream that wants to demonize her and paint her out to be a fraud without any you know justification without giving any reason for it all other than because the FDA says so yep their unelected body they have a lot of power over your life, and you have no, no say in that power. Nope. Yeah. It's self-regulating. It's kind of a hard thing to, to wake up to, but that's the truth, and you better wake up to it because if you don't stop them, they're going to make your life miserable. Like those murderous cops, they'll do an internal investigation. They'll all get taken care of. That's right. Self-regulating. All right. Well, thank okay. you, Randy. Thank Thanks, you, Dr. Sir. Carpenter. Thank um, you. And just so you people think that oh you're putting on this on youtube they're going to make a lot of money on the youtube views we're not commercializing this this is out there i don't want anybody to think that i have a bottom line interest in this my bottom line interest is i want there to be a cure for cancer i want to live to be 200 years old 
And uh. there is, in spite of everything, all the insults, attack, uh, that don't stop, continue on. All they have to do is look at the science of what I say and they'll know that it is correct and it does work. It is, has been known forever that he kills the issue. The issue is how do you kill uh, just the cancer and nothing else and that's how, it's pretty easy. Yeah, and I think this is a pretty open and shut case. I think that the jury has no choice but to come down with a guilty verdict for the FDA. They are guilty of malfeasance, betrayal of the public trust, guilty and they should all be in prison. And that's all there is to that. Thank you both so much. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to call it a show. Thank you, And uh, I hope all of you listening on the podcast, if you listen to this whole thing, take some action on this. Uh, don't, just, don't just hunker down and say, well, it's not my fight. It is your fight. And by the way, I just got through reading a story about a guy in China that lived 256 years. It Documented. Wasn't. Chinese keep in- incredible records. They've been keeping incredible records for 5,000 years. They have a record of his birth in the 17th century. He lived into the 19th century, Holy to the 20th God. century, actually, the beginning of the 20th century. 256 wow. years. Wow. Our Probably modern medical system is killing us. Yeah, I know. What was the well, secret? Chinese, Chinese medicine is not based on drugs, you know. Doesn't it's, use it's right. It's based on herbs and raw foods and the correct presentation of food, the balance in life. The, uh, they keep stress Sometimes. out of their life. They... Mm. Sometimes Exercise. it's based on uh, dehydrated bugs, but uh, you know. <laughs> when this when this guy was 150 years old, he was giving martial arts training to people. Wow. That's how he was in good shape. Yeah. So, so don't think that that oh I you know I'm going to trust my doctor. Well, <laughs> no. I got a news for you. Doctors die, on average, 10 years earlier than the average couch, couch potato. So yeah, they got a lot. They got a lot of knowledge that's doing them a lot of good, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. And actually, when they tell you you have to be on diet, they are not. Anyway, they, diet is. Yeah, crazy. it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you better st- take responsibility for your own life, and you better do something about this. And I want you to take action. If you don't, I'm be disappointed in your listeners. But if you're smart enough to listen to this podcast, you're smart enough to know that that you know you're. You're doomed if you don't start doing something about this. You got to spread the word. Get your friends, the people that are in your sphere of influence. You got to get them convinced of how bad this is, so we can start doing something about it. And it just starts with, you know, a few people, and it can become millions of people. Yeah, it could. But do you know if you start with a, on a checkerboard with a penny on one square? And you move one square and you double that to two pennies. And you move another square and double it to four pennies. There is not enough money in the world to finish that operation. Yeah. So if you can just start, hmm. if you can just bring this information to two people and have them bring it to two people each, and have them bring it to two people each, this will become a huge movement. So don't underestimate your power. Just start, we're going to do this underground, we're going to do it without going on TV and trying to uh, use propaganda. We're going to do it by using something uh, that hasn't been used for a long time in this country. It's called the truth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, dot com and medicalconspiracy.com. More info on Dr. Carpenter, you can go to either one of those websites, and there are plenty of links there. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's a wrap. Thank you both so much. And, Thank, and you. Thank you. I'm, I'm praying for you, Dr. Carpenter. Thanks. I Thanks. really need it. Thank you. You're very welcome for all that you've done. I appreciate your courage more than you can. I can tell you. It's just uh, this. I wish I could do more than I'm doing tonight, but um, and I will hope that I can later on. But I'm I'm not giving up either. This is a lot. Okay. Yeah. This, this is a lot at stake here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in touch, and hopefully things will go well. All Good right. night, and. Uh, th- well, I guess we'll call this a wrap. There's no music to gracefully exit to until <laughs> until we edit this. So we'll mix it in. Uh, I'm gracefully exiting. The music is playing. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for listening.
mistaken, I believe.